will resonate. Uh, I think it was three years ago today, The Guardian in the UK wrote a pretty damning piece about bioplastics, and I remember sitting on the European Bioplastics booth and figuring out how we respond to that. The message today is how times have changed. So it's been three years. I point you to a, re a book that just published here, and I'm not here to sort of tell you about, this isn't a book club, so I'm not going to tell you about good books I've read. But this is worth a read, because better than anything, this book epitomizes how the conversation has shifted in the last couple of years. No longer is a discussion about the problems and the issues with bioplastics. This book beautifully addresses the opportunities and the challenges with plastics, all plastics, petro, bio, and the author, Susan Frankel, does a fantastic job of talking about the issues, the opportunities, the upsides, the downsides, and she points a clear path forward. So this is a super text, and it's sort of, the way Susan, the author, frames things up really introduces nicely the rationale for an exercise we, NatureWorks, within GEO, have done for now seven years. For the last seven years, in April, we've introduced a project we call NGO Earth Month, which is basically what we're doing is ganging up the latest set of NGO consumer adoptions across all brands, putting them in one collection, and using it, frankly, to provoke a discussion, a discussion with thought leaders, stakeholders, NGOs, fans, detractors of bioplastics, to talk about what's happening in the market, what's working, what's not, some pretty frank conversation because we never pretend we're perfect. So this year we've done the same thing again. In Geo Earth Month we've launched another collection of products. You can see a teaser of it right over here in the sort of wooden shelving, thanks to uh, European Bioplastics. And what I want to do now is go through that collection, just quickly highlight some sort of case studies of what's worked and what hasn't. So some of these won't need much introduction. Stonyfield Farm, some six months ago, leading organic dairy in North America, was the first to do a wholesale change out from polystyrene packing to a, to a geo. They took the rigid polystyrene packaging, flipped to plant based in geo. What we like is the way they did it. And you can see the quote from their, their CEO, who's a real thought leader in the organic space, where he said, Look, I'm not compromising on cost, I'm not compromising on performance. I can down gauge and get cost uh, equality. And because this plastic formulation, which is 90 plus percent in geo, is tougher than the polystyrene, he's actually got um, better shipping yields, less broken yogurts. So let me make it concrete. This is from the leader of their uh, R&D. He talks about the thinner they ran the stuff, the better it ran. So I'm sort of emphasizing the point I made up front, that responsible innovation isn't about compromising performance. Put it where it works. And this is what happens. So. This is a North American example with Stonyfield Farms. There's obviously a much closer to home example here, right here on this booth. You see, you can sample it over here with uh, Danone, and I don't think I need to sort of introduce it. It's been well covered, and you've got the Danone folks here to speak to it directly. This is Activia, uh, Activia launched in Germany. Again, wholesale change out from polystyrene to NGO. What I do want to drill into in a bit more detail is something that if you've not heard about you, well, I don't know where you've been living for the last two years. This one has been pretito well known. Uh, PepsiCo owned Frito-Lay, who owns the Sun Chips brand, two years ago launched the uh, Sun Chips packaging in NGO. And it's a classical study in sort of what it really takes to make things work, and you don't get it quite right the first time. So I'm going to step through this one in a bit more detail. I'm going to do it using this construct from an industry consultant that's fairly well known. It's called the Gartner Cycle time along the x-axis, sort of from inception to maturity, versus visibility in the market. This is often the curve that new innovation, new technology follows. And rather than sort of explain this general curve to you, I'll just sort of illustrate exactly how this works with Frito-Lay. So typically what happens with any new technology is a technology trigger at time zero when something new and cool is available. And for the Frito-Lay case, it was basically way back in the early 2000s when we worked with the food converters, folks like Tagleaf, to figure out how to make biaxially oriented PLA, in films. Shortly on the heels of that technology innovation, we figured out how to make metallicized NGO. Spent like three years looking for the right brand owner to work with, found Frito-Lay, another three years working with Frito-Lay's packaging group to develop this fairly complex structure. And in 2009 on Earth Day, they launched their first generation Sun Chips bag. This is one-third NGO, one-third bio-based. It was the print layer, the outer layer. No claim to be compostable. That was not what it was about. It was a bio-based, low-carbon footprint package. You can see it, so certainly excitement was building, visibility was building, as they did a fantastic job PRing this bag. 
what happened a year later, Earth Day of 2010, was they launched the second generation bag, 100% compostable structure, all layers in geo. This, is, this took the market by storm in terms of mind share and thought leadership. And if you've not seen it, 150 million impressions in the social media space within a couple of days. Um, it was a North American only product, but it got tremendous coverage, both sort of popular press, um, trade press, you name it. This is what is called in the driver cycle the peak of expected and uh, inflated expectations. And you can kind of get what's happening here. Um, overly inflated expectations, and when you overly inflate something, it breaks. And that's precisely what happened here. Um, literally, six months later, at the end of 2010, we're in what the Gartner, Gartner folks call the trough of disillusionment, where there's a, a 180 swing of the pendulum from, you know, next best thing to slice bread to everything, the market only seeing what's wrong with the product. And here, the press was comical, probably not so for the Frito Lay folks, but you've seen this, or probably heard about it. So a lot of flack in the market about the noise of this bag. Polo with Tag Leaf did a nice job showing the physical properties, the higher modulus of the film. That's precisely the thing that lets you down gauge in thermoforming and let make lighter weight in geo structures. It gives a stiffer, in a film structure, it gives you a, a stiffer structure that could be noisier. So in this trough of disillusionment is when many folks exit the market. What Frito-Lay did, I'm going to read some of the analogies, and some of them are funny, frankly. Um, what Frito-Lay did is backed up a step. They went from they went from five flavors in NGO, all their flavors in this compostable bag. They left the flagship flavor in NGO, four back. This is in the US, in Canada. They left all the flavors, were left in the compostable structure. I don't know if the Canadians just don't hear as well or what the deal is. But they went back to the drawing board for six months, to work with their entire supply chain, ourselves included, to fix this. Long story short, they then got on what the Gardner folks call the, the slope of enlightenment, where they sort of more mature. It's neither you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread, and it's not negative either. It's more of a balanced view of the world, and the problem is fixed, the point being. And what Frito-Lay did here actually didn't change the backs of the oriented film structure at all. What they changed is the glue that laminates the two layers together. And that's how they made a quieter structure. It turns out at this point that there's quite a, uh, quite a few experts developed out there in the world that know how to measure the noise of a bag. And this is basically now a parody with any other chip bag out there in terms of performance, and it has, of course, solid equal credentials and it can be composted in the right structure. So, what's happening now, we sort of went through this whole wild roller coaster, hold on to your seats, there's not a typical for new product. Full credit to PepsiCo and Frito-Lay for staying the course, fixing the problem. What's happened now is that since they've launched their fix, we're sort of at the more mature market phase, and that's an over-exaggeration, this is a nascent market, but the point is, the, the consultants call the plateau of productivity, where productivity for Fatal A is going to be greater economy of scale through the supply chain, cost reduction. And this is where the point where others in the market start to follow. And you see that with none other than a North American retailer, a leading retailer, Target, switching their in house store brand, salty snack brand, to a similar structure. So, a little more detail on that one. Target, for those of you that know North America, leading retailer. What they've done here is not a compostable structure. They've gone with something, their version of the first generation bag, one third bio-based, and it's all about low carbon footprint bag. Nothing to do with composting because there's not a lot of infrastructure in North America for that. So this sort of illustrates what we love to see. We and many of the other European Bioplastics members, we supply typically into the top of long supply chains to market. We're a resin producer with India. What this demonstrates is the entire value chain down to the consumer, including the channel caption, the retailer and the brand, coalescing around a common value proposition, a common argument, which is low carbon footprint, bio-based content matters. There may be in some applications the outer of a compostable structure, maybe not. This is not compostable. But it's that evidence of basically big leading international brands coalescing around bio-based as an important value proposition that's key to us. This is yet another proof point. You see it over here in the NGO gallery. This is Coca-Cola's cold cup. Typically polyethylene line, and you're going to hear about it this afternoon. They're of course now bio-based variants of polyethylene. The value proposition here is clearly though in food service where to have a compostable cup. Coke needed that in their staple lineup. They've had this in their lineup for a couple of years, and my point is not that it's a new offer, but 
it's a val you know, valuable business proposition for them. They continue to offer it. Replace the PE lining with in an NGO based coating to have a compostable structure. And again, here you see world leaders like Coke coalescing behind that low carbon footprint argument. Everyone, I think, is well aware of what else Coke has done with their plant bottle, where they want to go from petro-based PET to bio-based PET. Pepsi also working on the same thing. So that commonality, everybody looking at low carbon footprint as a common value proposition, biodegradable, compostable, maybe an add-on in some applications, but for us, it's only important in food service work. Walmart is one of the biggest and first movers in the market for us where they replaced PET with NGO. They, they made this switch some six years ago. They continue on and what they've just done a year ago is switch their market side is their in-house store brand. They've now got that a commonality across the whole platform where it is all in NGO, from rigid to flexible for North America. And for Walmart again, it's nothing to do with compostable packaging. It's all about carbon footprint. Walmart has some super lofty goals of 20 million tons of carbon taken out of their supply chain by 2020, I think is the goal. So the lens at which they look at every product is what does it do in terms of carbon footprint? This is what they attribute to the, and we, I won't give the exact numbers, but the millions of pounds of NGO that they're putting on their shelf is giving them this sort of carbon savings. Another example, Japan-based Shiseido, going after what would typically be an HDPE application. You can see it on the shelf over here. And last, I don't want anyone to think, when I talk about responsible innovation, I'm talking about just packaging. I mean, this applies to all those products out there that we so take for granted. Here, uh, European brand Electrolux, really an international brand, has replaced an NGO non-woven, what used to be polypropylene, now it's made in uh, NGO. Again, products rather, rather than their packaging, still in, in the non-woven space. Here you see the, the non-woven fabrics and the diaper being replaced with NGO. The wet wipe, in this case, is 100% NGO, replacing what was a 30% polyester blend. But finally, again, not just about packaging. Here you see an injection molded products. For those of us that still write with real pens, print, you know, great uh, German-based brand, Henkel, the print correction roller. And here, a pretty iconic product made for the Apple iPhone, BioSiri with an NGO blend, made, formulated to act and feel a lot more like a softer plastic, like a PE. So I've covered a sort of smorgasbord of brands, and I hope made the point, and I would sort of argue to you that what I've just shown you is not a collection of green products. I hope that's not the takeaway. I, I would argue what I've shown you is a gorgeous set of products. They look good, they work well, They've got solid equal credentials to boot, and that is the point. This isn't about introducing green products. Responsible innovation means products with a better environmental footprint, so they better damn well work well, look good, and feel good. And that's what these guys have achieved. Some easier than others. I gave you the classic example of the roller coaster that uh, the Pepsi went through. So that's really what I wanted to cover: is how NGO is an example because European bioplastics obviously represents broad set of bio-based producers, but in, as an example of how it's making valid business sense for these leading international brands. So what I wanted to cover, I um, want to wrap up with a quick uh, thank you to European Bioplastics for hosting the collection of the booth and inviting us to talk. You can look at the collection over here uh, on the shelving. You can see the full collection over on the uh, NatureWorks booth. Um, and really that is what I had. So appreciate your attention and there is time for questions or come find us at the booth. Thank you.